We sometimes, in hearing the parables taught by our Lord and Savior, we accept one theory, or we give it one thought and accept it as that. All of his parables are, as I like to say, they're pregnant. They continue growing. As our knowledge expands, then we must broaden our horizons, whereby we better understand. And as as scattered sheep are sown, and those sheep are his children, which is the same equivalent to the seed as you scatter seed, it is planted. Therefore, in that great book of Hosea, Jezreel, meaning scattered and sown. And through this, if you have within those that are scattered certain that God has chosen to hear his word and to continue his word, teach his word, then we are very near the purpose of God's scattering. So with that thought in mind and knowing this, scattered sheep, and I want you to think of a parable for a moment. If a man had 100 sheep, and one should leave the flock, would he not put the ninety-nine to the side and go after the one? Therefore, those that are scattered should take great security within this to know though those were scattered, God has his eye upon them at every moment, watching, protecting. And I do not think we would be in error to say from this parable, though the one go astray and he leave the ninety-nine, that perhaps he does not have more attention upon the one than he does the ninety-nine. That means he cares. And that means also that you have a wall, you have a protector, you have an intercessor. And as Jesus looked out upon the people, and he had compassion, I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9 for me. And let's take this thought a little further, if we may, in his word. This will be basically a personal message to the scattered sheep of our Father. I want you to see that within the scattering there was a purpose, therefore, as he called them in the Hebrew tongue, that first son born, Jezreel, meaning scattered and so on, it was God's purpose to, in those ten tribes that went north, to scatter them and to sow them. It's one thing to scatter something, but with the second meaning meaning so on, it means something took root. And least you take root, lest you take root, then you're a dead seed. In other words, you're not producing. A seed can hold over for many years, but finally, when the correct moisture, that dew from the heaven, which is the rain of God, that stimulates that embryo and brings forth life and truth, then that person becomes somebody in God's Word. Sowing, yes. Sowing and growing. Scattered sheep, yes. And producing wool. Chapter 9, verse 36. Jesus, uh, while he's among the people, but when he saw the multitudes, when he looked out at the children, he was moved. Do you know what that means? He was touched with compassion on them because they fainted. This means they were weak, some of them ready to give up, wondering what life was all about, downtrodden. What's my purpose? What's my destiny? What would God have me do? That's what he's talking about here. That's what this word fainted means. Tired and worn out. And we're scattered abroad. Underline the word abroad. Abroad means from the land of Palestine. Abroad means even to other shores. As sheep having no shepherd. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had tried to, attempted to shepherd them in, in that general local locale. hadn't worked too well. But then you had sheep that were scattered abroad that had no shepherd either. And of course, the shepherd of shepherds, the shepherd, from his mind came these thoughts. He had what? Compassion upon them. 
again, explaining even the parable, if one go astray. I leave the 99, that doesn't mean he would leave them defenseless, he would leave them in a protected place and go after that one. And then catch the thought of his mind, 37, then said he unto his disciples. This is to say, what does disciples mean? It comes from, our word discipline comes from the same root word. It means students that discipline themselves in the word of God. His disciples said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. In other words, there are very few that are able to work among those sheep. Pray ye therefore the Lord. In other words, you pray to the Lord and ask what? Pray to the Lord of the harvest. That's, that's a, quite a statement within itself. He's the Lord of what? He's the Lord that determines how much you will harvest by what you put into it, as well as his blessings from the rain that falls upon the harvest. I speak in an analogy that he will send forth laborers unto the har his harvest. In other words, you pray for fellow laborers. Pray that God will send people that are able, that have the ability to labor in that harvest. What might that mean? Well, if we were to take this ministry, there are many laborers here. Many people labor at different things, but we're all one body. We are all that body, many membered body, that labors to one end. And that end is that this word, not our word, this word, which is the seed that is scattered, which is the voice of the shepherd that gives purpose and meaning and depth to the root that the seed is able to accomplish to sustain itself even in these troubled times, whereby when others would weep and wail and wonder, it becomes a strong plant. Even as the little mustard seed might sprout forth so tiny, but it grows into a great bush that many can take comfort from. Yes, all that would believe that that was the fruit of it, which is to say, his word, his planting. This is not a new thing that Jesus taught even at this time. It was taught throughout God's word from the beginning to the end. They shall smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall scatter. It was predicted from the beginning of time, and that is many well many call questions and say, Prove the first advent. That proves the first advent, that the shepherd would be smitten, and the sheep would scatter. Had Christ established his kingdom at the first advent, that prophecy would have been to no avail. But it's real. The first advent is written of, and the sheep scattered. And he said in another parable, I have sheep of another pasture. Those that through the scattering of the seed, which is to say the truth, would pick up on that and lead their people in the word of God. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. Let's go to 119, that great psalm. Let's understand, was the scattering of the sheep spoken of prior to this time? Psalms 119, I want to pick it up about verse, let's take it at 169 with that Hebrew letter Ta, Ta. Psalms 119, you will all remember this is an, is a, an acrostical psalm. And to understand that acrostic, of course, we have tapes explaining why Ta is placed here, why that the alphabet Kof and Resh would be placed at other syllables. For this is a beautiful psalm. But 
with the thought of scattering, may we begin Psalms 119, 169. That lamb that thinks there is no hope, that lamb that sometimes feels sorry for itself thinking it has no place, may it always have the wisdom to turn to the seed, to the Word, and understand where all wisdom comes from, that is to say, the Word of God. 169, let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding. Give me what? Confusion? Clear, uh, that that confuses? No, understanding. That's common sense that brings forth clarity according to thy word, according to what understanding, according to our Father's word, not what some man might say, not some tradition of man, but from this word, this word from which all blessings flow. Let my supplication come before thee, and as the one out of a hundred, you can rest assured, it is his promise in that parable, your supplication, your petition will be heard. We'll come before him. Deliver me according to thy word. According to thy word, thy promise, God. According to your promise. You promised it. I claim it. Let me ask you something. In all your troubles, do you ever claim any of the promises of God? Well, I, I don't know that I ever heard of the promises. Then it's no wonder you're in trouble, friend. Bad trouble. Claim the promises. Exercise it. Be an active Christian. Be an active sheep. Let it be real, for Christianity is not a religion, it is a reality. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. Do you ever praise God? Do you ever thank him? That a truth from this word, from his orders, his commands, those commands that you are to be obedient to, do you ever praise him for the fact that you have the knowledge even to be obedient? Because through the obeys comes the blessings. Well, I haven't received many blessings. Well, if you are not aware of that, it's no wonder. He didn't promise any blessings to you if you don't claim the blessings and perform according to the Word. Well, I always heard all you had to do was be a Christian. Let me ask you a question. What does it mean to be a Christian, to do this Word? And friend, you can claim to be anything you want to. And you could have listened to man that told you all you had to do is say, I'm saved and claim to be a Christian and you're a liar. If you're not familiar with his word, you're a fake. You're playing church. You're playing Christian. For as I would tell you, if you had a business and someone walked in the first day and said, I want you to know that as much as you've hired me to work in your vineyard, that I just want to sit here because I'm free. Now, if my good friend Joe here, who has a cotton plantation, if he hired a man at the beginning of the season and he come in and told Joe, hey, I've read your instructions, I know everything, and I'm, I want to accept and become a part of your plantation. I want to draw full salary. I want all blessings. But I want you to know the Lord has set me free and I ain't helping nobody do nothing. I'm not going to listen to you. I don't need to know how to hold the cotton or spray it or whatever, you know, as time and years go by. And when that old sun, that old hot sun is dusting down on you all's back out there, remember, I'm saved. I am a special child of God that has the privilege to be lazy, no good for nothing. That's what a lot of Christians are saying. They don't care about the Word. They don't care about the work. And God hates a sluggard, which is a lazy person, who takes and never produces. Well, do you all want me to tell you what Joe would do to that old boy? You all know Joe. Joe would say, hey, boy, you ain't no part of this plantation. You're kidding yourself. And he would take a two before and give that old boy his final paycheck. Right? Well, God does the same thing. 
Well, God never blesses me, and I'm a Christian, and what's wrong with my life? You never do anything. You never do anything to receive a blessing. You never claim one. If that be your lot, I'm glad none of you are that way. All right? Because that's where those poor me baby cry babies come from. You show me a poor me cry baby, and I'll show you a lazy Christian, a no good Christian. Well, does that mean you don't love? Them? Oh, I love them, but that doesn't change the fact they're no good. We can love you can love them all you want to, but they're still no good for God's service. Just like well, you don't have pews in your church. Well, no, I've got tables there because I expect you to work. I expect you to have your Bible, the Word, out there, not listening to this man's Word, but working. We're not playing church. Okay, point made. More than made. Right, Joe? <laughs> 172. My son shall speak of thy Word. What are you going to talk about, friend? His Word. For all thy commandments are righteous. There's not a lazy one among them. They're all righteous. That means they're fair and they're just. That means they're fair to you and they're fair to your neighbor. Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. Have you chosen the Father's words line by line? Precepts mean line by line, chapter by chapter. Not choosing a little verse here, a little verse there. But the precepts, not part of them, all of them. I have learned for thy salvation, O Lord. And thy law is my delight. Your command delights me. It keeps me out of trouble. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee. And let thy judgments help me. When God is judging you and correcting you, it will help you, I assure you. You may not, not enjoy it at the moment, but by the time he gets through molding that little old clay body of yours, you're going to be somebody. You're going to be worth something. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant. Come after me, Lord, for I do not forget thy commandments. I just want to continue this on. If you're ever down and you're ever feeling low, remember them. 120. Psalms 120. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Do you allow your soul to listen to lying lips and deceitful tongues, that is to say, the voice of Satan, as he teaches certain theories even in the so-called churches of this nation? May he deliver your ears whereby you have ears to hear that you can discern a lie from God's precepts, His truth, and that you have the common sense and the knowledge that when you hear a lie, though it be spoken in such a sweet manner, all you have to do is say you're saved. Salvation is a beautiful thing. It's the first step. Then after that, you're to mature into a full-grown adult Christian. What shall be given unto thee? Question. Or what shall be done unto thee? Thou false tongue. What's going to happen to the Kenite, Satan's own children on this earth, that he still even used the word itself, only he twists it just a little bit? Can you discern the difference? Can you discern truth from that lying tongue? What's going to happen to this old boy, Satan, and his own that lie, cheat, steal, Truths from people. Sharp arrows of the mighty. Who's the mighty? Almighty God. He will send sharp arrows after that one with coals of juniper. Buddy, that means charcoal. Juniper is the best charcoal you can find, and it cuts like a knife. It burns through and through. Woe is me that I sojourn. Underline it. What does it mean when you're sojourning? You're not home, friend. You're journeying in Meshach. Where is Meshach? And what, it isn't really a, necessarily a city. It refers to a people that is to the north, way to the north of Yahushalem. But I dwell 
in the tents of Kedar, though I even am scattered among the children of Ishmael. Kedar in the Hebrew meaning dark. Uh, six, my soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Let's go one more psalm, short, and it'll be meaningful. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. You know what hill that is, friend? Mount Zion, both spiritual and or otherwise. My help cometh from the Lord, and don't you ever forget it, which made heaven and earth. Who made heaven and earth? The Lord did. Then who are you, little one? that you would think he could not help you. Oh, but my problems are, they, they are just a mountain before me. Well, talk to him. He created the mountain, friend. And many times the mountain that you call your trouble, he created just for you to see how well you can swim over mountains. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. You'll be steadfast, not a reed shaken in the wind. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. You think God's going to go to sleep and let, uh, well, I worry about it because this goes on 24 hours a day. He's with you, if you believe. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. You don't have to worry. Do you claim that promise? You can. It's made to you. The Lord is thy keeper. Boy, how fortunate you. Stop and think a moment. Now think. Don't read over that. He's your keeper. How lucky could one be? How would you like to have old Satan for your keeper? The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. When you're out there working in old Joe's cotton field and that sun's popping down, He'll be your shade, your umbrella, wherever you go in that field. The sun will not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. That sun will take care of you whatever time of the day it is, whether it's night or day, because you're a child of light, and there is no night for you for a thief to slip upon you, if you know the truth. No way. And he shall always protect you. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. Yeah, but he doesn't know about this evil against me. All evil! You know, we, we really set ourselves up as something special, that you could have problems no one else has ever had before. Oh, how unique you are, little one. How unique. He shall preserve thy soul. He'll take care of all your troubles, and at the same time, he will preserve your soul. Do you know what the word preserve means? What do you do to cucumbers whenever you take them out of the field that keeps them from wilting and drying up into a nobody? He pickles you, gives you eternal life. Now, let's not, let's, uh, let's not do overboard with the word pickle here, all right? Don't anyone misunderstand what I'm saying here. All right? Probably a bad choice of words, but let it stand. The point's made. Eight. The Lord shall preserve thy going out. Going out from where? The subject here still is Israel. And thy coming in from this time forth, and even forevermore. What a promise. How good he is to us, and yet some people still find time to worry. Oh, I can't handle it. Well, he knows you can't. I know you can't. I can't handle it, and he knows that. But he takes care of us real good. That I do know. And that I claim. And that you claim. And the stronger you grow within that, the more blessed you shall be from our Father in your daily life. Today you learn that the argument starts in the family to say, Satan, get off my back. In the name of Jesus, sir, he'll run from you. Otherwise, you'll be a sniveling snail. 
with Satan booting your you-know-what from one end of town to the other. Everywhere you go, you're in trouble. Everywhere you go, you're a downer because you listen to it. Oh, poor me. You're not a poor me. You're a child of God. Stand up and act like that child by claiming the promise that he has made to you. Let's go back, if we may now, to let's go to Matthew chapter 10 in conclusion. We started out in 9. Let's try 10. When Jesus had taught his disciples, the same group we were speaking of before, He told them in verse 6 of this chapter 10 to do what? Well, he said, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, it is true that this has a twofold meaning. Let me lay it out for you. It has more than that. But at the moment, we're going to talk about these two. It meant that he had not yet died on the cross for that, that other a field of sheep came into the inheritance because an heir must die before there's an... I'm sorry. The, the one that is owner must die before the heir can inherit. All right? You understand? And he had not yet died. But at the same time, he speaks to his disciples concerning who? Concerning the Gentile? No, not in this case. Does it apply to the Gentile? Well, yes, it does. So the kings and queens thereof. But it's for a very special time. It's for a time that you're going to be delivered up. Delivered up for what? Well, let's hear it from him. Verse 6 of chapter 10, the book of Matthew. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach. Do what? Since I be Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach. Do what? Did they be lazy? No, preach. Saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, have you seen it in the last 2,000 years? No, but I tell you this, it's at hand now. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. It all comes from me. I give power if you claim it, if you possess it. Give, and you'll receive even more. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Oh, well, you can't do anything without money anymore. Well, that's true, but God's the provider. You're looking in Shepherd's Chapel at a shining example of that. There is one thing certain. When we started, we didn't have any brass or gold. Was it brass? No, silver or gold. We had a lot of brass, I will say that, but we sure didn't have a whole lot of silver and gold. But for a small church in northwest Arkansas, in our back room, is more equipment than any local TV station has in any town. A national network. And even tomorrow, or in this coming future after the Passover, we already have purchased a new uplink, or rather transmitter, an exciter that is a backup to the one we right ha now have, whereby if we so choose, we can even start another network. And we didn't have anything. Did any of you have anything? I didn't. God provides. If you have the brass to take hold of this promise, you don't need, if you have a provider, and if you know who the provider is that wells us all into one, that is Yahweh, the Almighty. Nor script for your journey, nor two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves at your staff, for the workman is worthy of his meat. If you're feeding the sheep, they'll take care of you. I'll see to it. That's my promise. Understand, this does not mean void yourself of common sense, you know. 
I've seen a lot of people that said, I've prayed in that promise and I'm going out here and I'm going to preach. And boy, they come back with holes in their britches and shoes wore off their feet. But it didn't, I, I, you could talk to them a minute or two. It didn't take long to tell what they had forgotten. You might say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, they didn't know anything about God's Word. How can you preach except you know the Word? You're kidding yourself and you're trying to fool people and it won't work. You cannot preach until you have God's Word to preach. That's what I mean. Use a little common sense, all right? Verse 11, And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy. Who's goodly there? Who's a good man that claims to know God? And there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. You know what that really is saying? Find a goodly person and be goodly in return. You salute it. That means be good to them. Appreciate them. Whether they agree with you 100% or not, if they're providing you lodging, be good to them. Be fair. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. Wish blessings to it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. You hold your blessings. Yes, true servants of God are able to certainly wish blessings or pray for blessings upon the house. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. You know, that is one lesson that I suppose is the hardest to learn, and how many times I wish we could make that clear. We will have people that will call, and if well, I went over to this brother's house, and I worked with him, and I talked with him, and he just won't believe. What can I do? Kick the dust off your feet, sharpen up, and get away from him. He's not worth it. That's simple, isn't it? But you'll have. But it's my brother. He's your brother. Love him, but his ears are sealed. If he won't accept the true word of God, the true teachings, you don't want him in your midst because he will be a troublemaker. And you won't have peace within your own body. You'll have strife. Because when you force uh, someone to the bridle before they're ready to take the bit and work, you've got a troublemaker. You ever broke horses? I have, and I guess I'm dating myself, but I've helped my old granddaddy break a many of them. He was a horse trader. And boy, there's a difference in working with a team. Do you know what a team means? That means people that work together. Than it is to hook a maverick up to a gentle old mare or something that knows the business and have that fool show off. Woo! You not the plow goes this way and that away, and you get up a ladder and everything is. Uh, my granddad had special choice words at this time that I dasn't not repeat. <laughs> he had names for horses you wouldn't believe that acted up, but that's what a man that will not accept the Word of God, will do to your work. Do you still want him? I would hope not. I mean, you can love him like a brother. But when you put a machine together, my friend, it's best to have all cogs fit, all right, where they turn smoothly one against the other. That's all it's saying. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. If the city won't receive you, get on. Do you know we use that same theory in television? We buy time in a city, and in all fairness, we try to stay there five or six months. And if it's producing seed, we stay. And in five or six months, you pump quite a bit of our Father's good currency into a city. If it's not producing fruit, just don't even worry about shutting that thing down. Shut her down and go where there's fertile ground. Sometimes I think many of these parables was written <laughs> to, to us, you know, that we certainly uh, don't understand. I'm not saying God's Word is for private interpretation. I'm just saying, boy, you can sure see the, the uh, results of many parables as as we take God's Word to this entire hemisphere. 
16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, friend, you can count on that. But you don't understand, that person said something bad about me. Well, a wolf usually will. But were, was it a shock to you? If it was a shock to you that people didn't exactly think you were the hottest little old thing, hottest little old word planter and seed carrier and man and woman of God that God ever chose, and they snarl and snap and bite at you, then you were mistaken, weren't you? Because he promised you it would happen. If you're doing what should be done, there are going to be people that are going to growl and snare at you. They did it him. But be harmless as a dove. You've all heard me say it many times. A dove is a bird of peace until you bother her nest. And man, you touch her little old nest and ounce for ounce, she's the fightingest bird in the country. Protect your home. But don't try to force God's Word on somebody. If they won't receive it, adios. 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and they shall scourge you in their synagogues. Do you know what this applies to? There's only one time in history that people shall be delivered up to the synagogues of Satan as it is written in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. That has yet to happen. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. For whose sake? For your sake? For my sake? No, for Christ's sake. He has a purpose for you. You're somebody if you receive this. You're delivered out because Christ wants to use you. Well, whatever can I do? Obey. Well, how do I do that? Well, listen and do it. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the nations. It says Gentiles. Yes, but it's nations in the Greek. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. What's it talking about? You know, you've got a lot of these boys that hit the road, the preaching trail. Well, I've got it right there. I don't have to know God's Word. I just jump right up there and He'll put the words in my mouth. And they fall flat on their face. Because this is not what that was talking about. When you're delivered up before the synagogues of Satan, then will he speak through you. Not before. Not before. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. You know what hour that's talking about, friend? You ever heard of the hour of temptation that you would escape? Yeah, that's when they fly us out. No, that's not what it's talking Fool, You can't do much good if you're flying, can you? Out. You're delivered up there for what? His purpose, that He can speak to you. And it won't happen until that hour. Well, what hour is that? Well, when they spoke in the tongues on Pentecost Day in every language to the world, they said, this is that that was spoken of by Joel. It doesn't take too much effort to go back to Joel then and read where it is written, when the locust northern army of Revelation 9 comes, then, and then only, shall this cloven. There are many tongues. We're talking now about the cloven tongue, which means it goes out in every language in the world with all clarity. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit of your Father, which speaketh to you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Who is death? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Jesus said, I came to this earth to destroy the old devil, which is to say death. They're going to be delivered up before death, which is to say Satan. For what purpose? A witness against him. And it won't be you speaking. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Hey, you can afford that, friend. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. No problem. But when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. 
If they won't accept you there, go to another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, the cities of the world, the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come. That's the second advent. The disciple, let's just say the student, is not above his teacher. That's what the master is, is the teacher. Nor the servant above his Lord. That's to say the bond, the servant against his master. It is enough for the disciple, that's the pupil, that he be as the teacher or his teacher and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house, Beelzebub, if they call Christ the demonic when he was here, how much more shall they call them of his household? Are you of that many-membered family? Then there will be many that claim to be Christians that will say you're all crossed up. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, dear friend, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. You find the best platform you can, and let her fly. And fear not them which kill the body, that means people, men, but are not able to kill the soul. There is only one that can kill a soul, and that's the living God. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Do you understand that when someone touches you, they touch the apple of God's eye, and he doesn't forget? Are not two sparrows sold for a fuffin? That's about a tenth of a penny. And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father knowing. Though you're a scattered lamb, when you're delivered up before death, which is to say Satan, the Holy Spirit has the very hairs of your head numbered. And God said in Revelation chapter 9, Hey, you go out and touch those that are fools. That is to say, those that are deceived, those that have listened to lies. But you leave my elect alone. That was his orders to Satan. Touch not those that have the seal of God in their forehead. That's why they can't harm a hair on your head. He can't lie to you because you know he's a liar. He cannot be tempting to you because you are a, you abhor him. You hate him. I speak of Satan. Fear ye not, therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows. Don't be afraid. Stand up, you're a child of God, and act like that. Uh, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, my friend, this is written to you also. If God has given you the truth, and he, the whole subject here is what? Is to deliver you up for a testimony. You want to know what the unforgivable sin is? We're talking about it right here, friend. Deliver you up for a testimony. You don't have to worry about a thing. God is going to speak through you. That doesn't mean you don't have to know God's Word until that day. But at that time, the message will be delivered through you, not you speaking, but that tongue of Pentecost day. That was the true Word of God. That the whole world may hear the truth. If you refuse that Word knowing who the Holy Spirit is, then what happens to you? But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. What is that sword? Have you ever read Revelation chapter 1, verse 16? My tongue is a two-edged sword. In other words, it cuts both ways, and Satan's lies cannot stand before it. Do you know how to take up that sword? This book, this word, the living word, how familiar are you with it? Then I can tell you what kind of service you can do to Christ. Let me say that again. It is according to how familiar you are with this sword as to how well you will be able to use it. Think about it. Analyze yourself. 35. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. 
In other words, the real truth oft times, unfortunately, cannot be received by an entire family. And how does it set, a, say, a father against a son or a daughter against a, a mother? You know, you've heard me say it many times, because those in the flyaway group will say, when the false one comes instead of Jesus, they think he is Jesus. And after all, they're good Christian folk, right? So that mother will run to Jesus and say, only he's not Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I've been saved since I was a little girl. And my girl's not a bad girl. But she thinks you're Satan. Go help her. Oh, he will. And the mother will cause the daughter to be delivered up before death, which is to say Satan, for an opportunity of a lifetime to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through her and for her. It was why Jesus said at this point, Woe to those that are with child when I come. At the time of this speaking, he wasn't talking about a mother carrying a child in her womb. He was talking about a bride he intended to claim as a virgin, and they already had a small suckling child when he returned. <laughs> they didn't wait for the wedding, friend. 36, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Those that care about him, those that really are deep religious, not necessarily Christian, but religious people. He that loveth father and mother more than me. You want to listen to them, friend, more than Christ is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If you're not, if you don't love his truth, Understanding and knowing full well that it puts you in a position where you can be the greatest service to your own. For in the millennium it is written in Ezekiel 44 that you can help them. That you will recognize them, know them, and can help them that have fallen now. That's when you can really show your love that you were not wrong. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. In other words, if you won't partake of his word, as we have studied in the Psalms this lecture, then you're not worthy of him. If you won't partake of him, why should he partake of you? He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me. That's pretty potent stuff, friend. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me, Almighty God, Yahweh. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of water, cold water, only in the name of a disciple, a student, verily I say unto you, he shall no more, uh, he shall in no Wise lose his reward. You can't lose it as long as you try. He'll do the rest. So we see then that message given to, that you're to give to those scattered sheep. To people everywhere. He has a purpose for you. You're not just, a, you, you have a, a destiny. Many of you knew years ago as a child there was more to God's Word than you'd been taught. And you were thirsty. You were hungry. You wanted to know who you were, why you were here. What is God's plan? I love Him. I know He's got to be a good Heavenly Father. And believe it because He is. And any time you think that He stacks up different than that, as a matter of fact, we might say, well, why didn't he mean he would bring peace? Ultimately, friend, but be patient. He comes to set people apart from each other that will not receive his word, whereby there can be a weeding out, whereby through the millennium they can be taught. Well, I worry about them. Well, I do too. But then what are you really interested in saving about them? Their flesh or their soul? Because many of them will not be able to be saved in the flesh. You can forget it. 
It will come in the millennium. And it will be their soul. So if you're worried about their flesh, then you're fleshly. You can be concerned about their flesh, but you worry or be concerned for their soul. Be patient with them. Never look down upon those that do not have the full truth. For no one has the full truth, not even you. There's a lot more to go. There's a lot more of his word that he hasn't even made known to man. But we're going to keep working at it. We're not going to be lazy. And that that he gives us, we will not hide under a bushel. We will place it on a candlestick 23,000 22,300 miles in space and let it shine back to this hemisphere and who knows in a matter of months now it's a possibility that we will even be in another hemisphere that will put us to the world or a kin's work it can happen we're moving into a position where that's not difficult for us to think about at all. Not impossible, I'm saying. Because there's one thing. After you learn certain things and God shapes the clay and knowledge comes in about how to do things among men, then nothing is all that impossible. And yet, it is He that shapes the clay that puts you in that position. So, the sheep are scattered. Is that good or bad? It's very good. Because wouldn't we have really served some kind of God if he had chosen a little people in a little country and kept them there and let the rest of the world go to hell without a prayer, a chance? So he chose to scatter. But there's one thing I would have you concentrate upon or meditate upon. And that's that when an army is scattered, it's not necessarily at its strongest point. Therefore, each man must think for himself. I'm, I'll use an analogy as an army, all right, as a drilled army that works in unison as a group. They can do many things, but if you scatter it, it's just simply individuals, all right? So what I'm saying is, from that great army, you are an individual that is scattered, that he has a purpose for. How you been growing lately, friend? How, how are your old roots doing? Think about it. Scattered seed must answer for themselves. That's why it's important that you know what he has to say and not what man has to say. But the reason I'm bringing this point up is do your very best. Do your very best as that seed that is scattered where you are. You are that seed. You are that lamb. Take all kinds of special... Uh, minerals or whatever you have to do to grow more wool. And don't misread what I'm saying, all right? And produce for God that he may have a good harvest. For <laughs> the harvest is there, but unless you labor at it, friend, as a chosen labor of God, it ain't going to get harvested, all right? You got it? We thank him for his promises and what he has done for us. You are or you can be quite a harvester. Think about it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your truth, for your blessings. We thank you for your guidance, Father. And as Jezreel in the Hebrew, the scattered ones, the sowing ones, Father, look upon this harvest. And let these laborers, Father, have thy blessings. For by, Father, the crop, the fruit, and may that fruit be the souls of thy children. Souls given hope and understanding and desire and purpose. 
that from the turmoil then comes the true peace, which is you in their soul, Father. That sword that brings the only peace of mind. Thank you, Father. We ask it in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen.